Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kulaga, Executive Creative Director of the New York Times Live Conversation Series, Times Talks. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's Times Talks Deal Book event, featuring Andrew Ross Sorkin in conversation with financier and philanthropist Stephen A. Schwartzman. I want to give special thanks to tonight's sponsor, Accenture. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Katinka Wallstrom, Senior Managing Director of Financial Services North America for Accenture. Katinka? Thank you, Tom. We are proud to sponsor tonight's Times Talks Dealbook event. I know we're all excited to hear the discussion between Andrew and Stephen. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Tonight, I wanted to spend a minute, and only a minute, on Accenture's commitment to innovation. Innovation might be a buzzword these days, but for us, innovation defines the way we bring intelligence and insights to help our clients every day. This includes the 800 million that we spend in R&D every year, and the close to 7,000 patents and patent applications that we have in areas like cyber and cloud and artificial intelligence and blockchain, and the hundreds of researchers that spend their time anticipating and staying ahead of business and tech trends that we believe will change the world. To be truly innovative, we believe that it starts with a culture of equality. At Accenture, a core tenant is our focus on inclusion and diversity. To deliver creative ideas, to bring diverse perspectives, we need lots of different skills at the table. This commitment starts at the top, and we expect our leaders at all levels to help create and sustain a culture of equality, where everyone can advance and feel empowered to be their best, both professionally and personally. We've set bold gender equality goals, such as achieving a gender-balanced workforce by 2025. Reaching these goals uh, will support us as we continue to bring fresh perspectives to help solve our clients' challenges and discover new opportunities. So with that, thank you for joining us. And now back to Tom to introduce tonight's panel. Thanks, Katinka. We're very pleased to present Stephen A. Schwartzman, the chairman, CEO, and co-founder of Blackstone, and author of the new book, What It Takes, Lessons in the Pursuit of Excellence. Moderating tonight's event is Andrew Ross Sorkin, New York Times columnist and the founder and editor-at-large of DealBook. He's also a co-anchor of CNBC's Squawk Box and the author of the best-selling book, Too Big to Fail, the inside story of how Wall Street and Washington fought to save the financial system and themselves, reissued last fall on the 10th anniversary of the 2008 financial crisis. Be sure to pick up a complimentary copy, complimentary signed copy, of both What It Takes and Too Big to Fail following tonight's event, courtesy of Accenture. And now please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our moderator, Andrew Ross Sorkin, and our special guest, Stephen A. Schwartzman. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Hey there. Stephen Schwartzman, everybody. Thank you all for being here this evening, and thank you to Stephen Schwartzman for sitting with us. Uh, we're going to have a conversation, and at some point we're going to open this up and try to make this an interactive conversation. Uh, Steve is, uh, well, you all know who Steve is, but he is now an author. Uh, and I will tell you, I have uh, known and covered Stephen Schwartzman now for some 20 years. We were just discussing some articles right. that you liked and didn't like over the many years. <laughs> and. Um, I thought I knew who Steve Schwartzman was, but when I read the book, uh, I actually feel like I now know you in a very different way. So we're going to go through a lot of that, and then we're going to get to some of the news of the day and what's going on uh, in the world uh, and in the economy. Uh, but let me just give you a little bit of background uh, about Stephen Schwartzman, if you don't know it. Stephen Schwartzman grew up in the Franklin section of Philadelphia, where he worked at Schwartzman's Curtains and Linens. How old were you, 10 years old? Yep, about that. Actually, uh, eight. Eight years old. Even worse. Um, I should, he writes in the book that he, at that age, started a lawn mowing service uh, with two part-time employees, my younger twin brothers, 
They got half the revenue for doing the work, and I kept the other half for securing clients. The business lasted three full years before we had an employee strike. Uh, <laughs> he pitched his dad on turning this linens company into the next bath, uh, be Bed Bath & Beyond, only to be vetoed, so that didn't happen. Uh, but he is now, and I would say arguably, um, the most significant and consequential financier on Wall Street today. And in, and in addition to that, uh, has, turned, has become really one of the largest philanthropists uh, in the country. And in between all of that, he's become somewhat of a geopolitical consigliore uh, as a whisperer both to President Trump and the Chinese. And I want to talk to you about that as well and how that's going. Um, but here's what <laughs> that comes as a complete surprise. <laughs> but but here's where I want to start the conversation because I trying to under, the, what's interesting about this book is actually trying to understand you and what actually motivates you, and and what led you to this place. And we were talking behind uh, back in the green room. But here's I just want to read you this because there are moments in this book where Steve Schwartzman comes across as what I would say is remarkably vulnerable, even insecure at times. And yet, at the same time, you are always, almost always, uh, supremely confident. So here I want to tell you, he gets a job at DLJ, and he says, quote, I would cower in my office hoping no one noticed me, scared I would be found out as ignorant or incompetent. I must have been the biggest buyer of antiperspirant on the east side of Manhattan. <laughs> but then you go on to say that when you got this job, you were offered $10,000. That was going to be your, your, the opening, the opening uh, offer. Or I think that was the offer. That was the offer. And you said to the gentleman who had called you, I need $10,500. And he says to you, what do you mean? And you say, I need $10,500 because I heard there's another person graduating from Yale making $10,000, and I want to be the highest paid person in my class. <laughs> so explain this dichotomy of somebody who is both Anxious and nervous, and I should tell you, there's moments throughout this, uh, throughout this book, you say, I arrived at Harvard feeling the same way I arrived at Yale, socially isolated, suspecting that brilliant people are elsewhere. And then you go up to the, the dean, and you tell him that you've got teachers who can't teach, students who can't learn, and an outmoded curriculum. It was all true. <laughs> but, but explain this, this, this disconnect between this idea of, of, of being both, I think, insecure at some level, and then confident that at almost every other level that you could somehow figure it out and fix it. Yeah, at the, at the DLJ thing, I, you know, I don't know what I was thinking. I just wanted to be the top person. And you know, they offered me 10,000. There was one other guy who had 10,5. And I, I said, uh, you know, it was Bill Donaldson, who's a wonderful man. And I, I, I said, I need 10,5. And he said, why? And I, I said, because I want to be the top person. Uh, graduating from Yale, uh, you know, financially. So he said, well, that doesn't concern me, <laughs> which is a totally reasonable thing. <laughs> and and, and I, I, I said, well, it concerns me. <laughs> and he said, yes, I know, but it's 10,000. And, and I said, well, I won't take the job. And, and then what happened? He said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not kidding. That, that's what I want. I said, it doesn't make much difference to you. It's $500. And it's like really super important to me. He said, I really don't care. I said, well, then, you know, we're not going to be able to do anything. So he said, well, let, let me think about it. So he called me back in like three days and he said, OK, 10 5. <laughs> but I, I don't know what got into me, frankly. But, but I, you know, it was important. To me, and you know, I, I I put myself in situations that, you know, I, I, I are explicable to me. I can usually explain them to someone else as to why I want it, and if it's rational, you know, uh, usually people will do it. But but explain where this comes from, because there's a lot of asking. You know, even at 10 years old, uh, you know, you were getting paid 10 cents. Uh, an hour, I think, uh, yeah. from your grandfather, and you asked for 25 cents. I will then go on to tell you that when you were at Yale, this is fascinating, uh, you decided, um, and this is what, I want to get about, I want to get to the chutzpah part. Where did you, where did you come up with the chutzpah to ask for these things? You said the most glaring need I sensed among the Yale's undergraduate class was uh, that they, they lacked companionship. So 
he invented the Davenport Ballet Society so that women would come to Yale, and then you started calling the heads of the dance departments at all seven sister colleges. I just, I'm trying to understand that this, this sort of zest and chutzpah to think well, like that this was possible. Well, well, I always try and think about wh what's possible. What's the best thing that's possible and, and that makes sense and would excite everybody? And, and once I figure that out, that's the hard part, then the doing isn't so hard. All you do is you call them. They accept or they reject. If they reject, it's their problem. If they accept, that's good. They buy into the vision. So, so part of all these things is, is you know, sort of seeing in an ideal world what is the best possible thing that you could create. And people will come to that. OK, well, let me, let me ask you about this. By the way, um, you, you got the Davenport Ballet Society uh, to, to be up and running at, at school. I should, you, you write about this. This is fascinating to me, too. You say, in my final year, I decided to take on the bigger issue for all of the Yale men. This is um, that there was a 268-year-old uh, parietal rule that forbade women from staying overnight in a dorm room. I was dating a woman at a local college, so for me, it was, a, it was as much a personal issue as a community issue, and you managed to somehow have the rule overturned. Yes. Um, what made you think you could do that? I, I, I could barely discuss this in a politically correct environment. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but um, I, I sort of looked at that, and it wasn't working for me. Uh, and, and, and it was the 1960s, uh, second half, where you know, sort of uh, everything was possible. So, so I knew if I went to the administration, they'd say no, like they had for 278 years. And, and they'd say you were, you were basically um, getting in the way of other students' quiet enjoyment of their, uh, you know, their, their rooms and studying and so forth. So I, I said, well, OK. I, I know what's coming at me. All, all we have to do is put together a survey um, that, that of every objection that a student can have to, to getting rid of uh, parietal rules. Uh, and fortunately, uh, Yale was pretty centralized. It had 11 colleges. So I just got one person um, uh, to stand outside each dining room and give the forms out. And then I figured they're going to go in and eat. They're going to you know, fill out the form and put it in a basket. I got all those, tabulated them. Uh, and a friend of mine was the deputy uh, editor of the Yale Daily News, Reed Hunt, uh, who ended up as head of the FCC, of all things. And I said, Reedy, I got this survey, and it shows that 99 point, I think it was 6% of all Yale students couldn't care less whether there were any parietals. I said, we got to do something. He said, I'll put it on the front page. You know, four days later, it was gone, 278 years, because there was nothing to object to. So all you have to do is, is basically get into somebody else's mind and, and figure out what's motivating them or, or stopping them from thinking the way you do, defeat those uh, types of, that type of logic, and you know, more or less, they'll, they'll give up. <laughs> okay, so, I, but to that end, by the way, there's a line in here, and, and I actually read this line to my, I have two uh, twin boys who are turning nine this fall, and I, I actually, this weekend, I stopped. I was reading the book, and I said, guys, I want to just read you a sentence. Because this is the, this is the sentence of the book that they, they were looking at the book, and they said, who is this guy on the cover of the book? And I'm trying to explain who he is. And um, you write, there is nothing more interesting to people than their own problems. If you can find out what they are and come up with solutions, they will want to talk to you no matter what their rank or status in life. Yep. <laughs> when I'm, do you think you knew that? I, I, when do you I, think you realized that? Uh, junior high school, and um, there was, you know, was something going on at my school, Huntington Junior High School, that was all messed up. And it was like difficult for everybody in the school, so I figured out what a solution would be, and I just went to see the principal, which is like a big deal when you're in the eighth grade. And I said, dear Mr. Norton, I, I said, you know, it's sort of the following situation, sort of a mess, and I think this is what we ought to do with it. And he basically said, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought about that. You know, let's, let's do it. And so basically analyzing these logical messes and figuring out what you can do, 
it works pretty easily. And you can do this with anyone. And even if they're like famous people, uh, because you know, they're in the news, and you know what they're worrying about. You know, like if, if they're the head of a country, and you know, like if they're, they're head, you just call them. You know, and, and there's something going on that's clearly troubling, and, and you, you find some way to talk with them. They'll definitely focus on things because obviously they haven't fixed it, and it's it's if it's front page in the news, and if you can offer some good suggestions. Uh, they'll, they'll take them on board and discuss them, and you know it's it's not like there's difference in in status of any type. It's really just about dealing with with you know what's on their mind, right. and you know everybody's looking to solve their problems, right? So it's not it's not that big a deal. It just seems to be a big a deal if you're standing there with somebody who's like a big deal and you're not. So, How much so, do you think you're driven by what I might describe as a healthy, and it can be debilitating, but a, we'll call it a healthy insecurity? And the reason I ask is, you know, when you started your firm, you had left Lehman Brothers, and you started your firm with, with Pete Peterson, this is Blackstone, and Blackstone was not working in the first six months uh, at all. And you write in the book, you say, I felt I was failing on every count. I was overwhelmed with self-pity. Wall Street loves nothing more than watching other people fail. Truer words have never been spoken. Uh, to see Pete and me, who had been so powerful at Lehman, so sure of our success, take a beating would have given many people pleasure. I couldn't let it happen. How much do you think that's what this is about for you? Well, that's certainly, um, once anybody uh, decides to do something, particularly with their life, um, it's, it's a must do. I mean, you, you can't fail. And you try and think really carefully before you do something. And if it's well conceived and it's not working, that just means you have to move it around. Or, you know, maybe you're too early, the world isn't ready for you. And so you just suck it up and go back again. And, and you, you can never give up once you make that commitment. If, if, if what you're doing is completely ill conceived, you know, eventually you throw in the towel, but, but that's a long way. And you can't let um, things that, that throw you back, um, you know, there's any number of bad things that happen to nice people who, who are trying to accomplish something. Uh, the world isn't necessarily waiting for your arrival uh, or, you know, ready to change. Most people, despite what they say, don't like changing. They, they, they're comfortable in their space. So, so if, if you're in effect, a, like a, I guess they call them now disruptors or something, you don't think you're disrupting anybody, you think you're helping them, uh, and they don't respond, then um, you know, it, it's normal to be discouraged. Right. But you, you have to like, go back and see them in another six months. Uh, and you can just never stop. Okay, so I have a question about failure. Um, because even though your success today, it wasn't, as I said, always that way. And there's a particular transaction that you did early on in your career uh, at this new firm. The company was called Edgecoma. You can tell everybody the details. Uh, but it didn't work out. It actually failed quite spectacularly. And you went and visited with one of the investors. Um, and when you left that meeting, he writes, I, I, I wasn't capable. Um, I wasn't competent. I was a disgrace. I felt tears welling up, and my face turned red and hot, and I had to force myself not to cry. I said I understood, and we would do better in the future. And as I found my way to the parking lot, and again, this goes back to not failing, I vowed to myself this was never going to happen again. Tell everybody about what Edge Edgecombe was and, what, and how it changed you, because yeah. that actually was another piece of you that I didn't really appreciate. Yeah, this was truly terrible. Uh, this was our third deal. and. You know, I, I had one of our partners. We had no processes. I had never made an investment before. And I raised some huge amount of money with Pete. We were the third biggest uh, in the world uh, at that time. Uh, and, um, you know, one partner thought this deal was a good thing. And another one heard we were looking at it. And he came in to see me. He said it was going to go bankrupt because it was just making inventory profits disguised as real profits. And that when steel, was steel distribution business, when steel prices went down, as much as we were earning, we would lose that and more uh, on the way down, and the company would go bankrupt. So King Solomon here 
uh, you know, sort of very self-congratulating, uh, picked the person who brought the deal who was the optimist, and within six months, we couldn't pay our interest uh, on the debt, and ultimately, um, we, we, we lost uh, all of our money. Uh, and this was, this was beyond traumatic. I don't like failure. I'm not used to it. We all have it. But um, th this was terrible. I mean, in my family, um, no, nobody ever raised their voice. So, so that's one reason I'm able to do some interesting things, because I can hear things with little nuances just because of the way I was raised. And here's some man screaming at me. Uh, and I'm sitting in front of him. and you know, what a fool I am and a fool he is for giving me money. And, you know, this was, this was horrific. It was shameful. Uh, and uh, I'm sort of sitting there taking it. Then I realize I can't, I, can't, I can't take it anymore. It's so awful. And, you know, my face starts getting red. I realize I'm going to start crying. Now, how can I, like, be crying in front of this guy? So, you know, I just sort of sucked it up and, you know, got through the thing. And I walked out in the parking lot and I said, this is never going to happen again. We're never going to lose money. We're going to figure out a way. And it was the most important thing in the evolution of the firm besides raising the capital. And we figured a way out, which is terrific. And we still basically do it today, where instead of one great man uh, or woman you know, uh, sitting at a table with everybody coming in and being interrogated by that person, you know, uh, historically what we've done is we use everyone at the table. We, we don't have anybody who's a paid audience. Uh, and, you know, just sort of to watch. Uh, and, and if you get like seven really bright people interrogating whoever brings a proposal to de-risk it, to talk about the risk, how bad can it be, and other things that the team didn't, didn't think about, by the time you reach the end of those eight people, boy, those people who brought something in, this is like a really, really uh, interesting experience. And you learn so much, then you set them back again for the stuff that they didn't think about. Then they come back, and they, we have procedures. You write everything up. You put the risk factors and the other things. And, and then you do it again to them. And by the time you do that three times, everybody knows everything about this one proposal. We can figure out all the risks, and it's completely impersonal. You know when you're walking in that room that's going to happen to you, you will be filleted. It's fun. And, and it's, it's, it's amusing. It's a contest. Uh, and so the team itself is infinitely better prepared because they know what's going to happen. And we do that. And then when we make a decision, it's with those two or three key variables. And that's usually if something blows up and it's a bad deal, that's why 90% of the chance, that's what it is. So the team itself um, doesn't have the risk of failure, because the failure won't be theirs. It's that we've misassessed things. So it leads people, ironically, to be very psychologically comfortable. Because one, they know what's going to happen to them. It's all just it, it, it's an exercise to learn and protect them, protect uh, the firm. Uh, and it's not dependent upon that one great person who normally, in most organizations, they take care of that interrogation. And when they turn that team down, they go away. They don't like it. If that team comes on another deal, if, if, he, does, if he or she doesn't like it, they turn them away. The people like it even less. The third time they come, if it's a month or two later, and they're turned down, then it's almost like open warfare. And the fourth time they come, almost no matter what they have, they'll be approved. Because the person making the decision just can't stand the psychic pain of, of, of the passive aggressive nature of, the, of smart people you know, who, who are trying to get something approved. And, and that's where most bad deals come from. They, they come from an organization that's worn down in decision making. And they know they're making a marginal decision. So we get rid of that. And we don't let that happen. And by, by instituting that, we took my liability, which is not so gifted, not so smart, and, and surrounding myself with people who are gifted and smart. And as a team, we just attack this, um, not attack people. We never attack a person, ever. We're attacking content. And it's regarded as such. And it's very successful. I love watching it now. I don't have to do so much. 
And you know, everybody's trained uh, to do that. It's fun. Let me ask a couple other questions uh, about the firm and its success. And then I want to get into a couple of other issues, uh, some in the news, and I want to talk about philanthropy as well. Um, it's a philosophical question, because you and I debated this like 20 years ago, um, the issue of size and scale yeah. in the investment world. And the prevailing view 20 years ago, if not 10 years ago, if not now, is that size is the enemy of performance. And you have become one of the biggest firms in the world. And you were the first firm to go public. And when you, when you write, by the way, about fundraising, you say, if you're going to uh, go to all the bother of raising five to $10 million, you may as well save yourself some legwork and ask for 50 to $100 million. And, and I, I was thinking about that. How much of that is about just the legwork piece, and how much of it is, is about that, the idea that you think you can actually do better with more? Well, it's both. There's a certain efficacy in not wasting your time. And you know, if, if somebody will give you 100 million, why take 10? You know, it's, like, you know, it's more efficient. Uh, but the only reason you want that is because you can do something with it. And you know, I, I guess when we were talking 20 years ago, I said I, I didn't agree with the premise that that large, um, basically. You know, I think you did because you were smaller. Well, no, we were never small. We were smaller, but we started out as the third biggest in the world. Uh, that's not so bad for a startup. Uh, you know, there are other people have been doing this for a lot longer. Plus, we didn't know anything. So, you know, th that gets points. Uh, and and we've always been at the large end of everything we do usually the largest. And what that does is enables us to do certain things. There, there's a lot of money, if you haven't noticed. We run huge deficits. Uh, and, and somebody's printing uh, that money. And, and so you know, um, uh, th th there are a lot of people who've gotten that money to go into competition with us in, in certain areas. And what you're always looking for is an advantage uh, or some type of moat. To, to protect what you're doing, because there are no patents uh, uh, in, in finance. There's no protection. Anybody can duplicate it. So if you're, you know, sort of in effect, can do the largest things uh, in the world uh, to the extent that they are on offer and it's sensible to do, by definition, you won't have much competition at all. You know, if you do something in the middle, there are probably, you know, 400 to 1,000 uh, companies that can compete with you. And, and so um, you, you also get this, these amazing flows, uh, and you become the friend of uh, financial intermediaries because we, we, we are the largest fee payer in the world. And one thing you learn about intermediaries, they like fees. They like to be paid. And if you can pay them more than anyone, that makes you more popular no matter how fundamentally unattractive you are. Uh, so. so so, so this, this is like a mutually reinforcing uh, system. Right. Uh, and you know, like today, I think we announced something for like $5 billion, uh, so some company that we were buying in the real estate in, in, in business. And, um, uh, and you know, it's like nobody competed with us. You know, it's, it's hard to put that much up on one deal. And we've got two other ones going on. And we just agreed on something else that's a secret just because it is. Uh, you know, that needed a billion six of equity. The number of firms that can just put that up and not worry about it is what? How many? Not much. So we use that as a, uh, as, as, as a, as a advantage. Uh, okay, so in the news right now then, yes. what do you make of what Masasan at SoftBank is doing? And the reason I ask is he's got yeah. A hundred billion dollar fund. He's got another fund. We got this WeWork IPO or non-IPO coming, and a lot of people look at that size and scale and say, "Ooh, that's that, that, we're not sure that's going to work." Well, it, it has to be deployed, but um, in a sensible way. What Masa did is is actually, you know, sort of um, like <laughs> I, I may regret I say this, but. It was almost genius-like, because what he did is he invented a new capital market. So, so you used to have these little venture com companies, all of which were you know, at the top end were famous. Maybe they would have a billion dollars of capital. 
Uh, so, so they couldn't really finance anything big. They did these little things. But some of these little bitty companies have grown up into these big things that are hemorrhaging as their cash as they're growing. Uh, and so you either go public, which itself isn't big enough uh, to fully fund uh, the equity of that company. You can't borrow money because the thing has no uh, uh, cash flow, typically. And, and so what Massa did, which is like really genius-like, is he said, you know what? There's this whole layer above venture capital that if I raise $100 billion, I can write any size check. There's nowhere else these companies can go. And so I will own the whole emerging venture business. And he does. Now, now that doesn't mean that every decision that's made because of that is wise. Uh, and I'm, I'm not speaking for that. I'm sure there'll be an array of uh, outcomes. But geez, positioning yourself as the only place to go, the only place to go for you know, all of these. Do so you think it's going to work? I, 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 it depends what, what, you, what you pay for what you get and whether you've analyzed right that the thing can really keep going. And on that, I, I can't uh, opine on it. Uh, you know, I'm sure there'll be some you know, sort of significant disappointments. Uh, but, but if you can get some right, um, you know, that, that's the way he's historically made a lot of money on Alibaba and uh, Yahoo and so forth. Um, so so you know, it's, it's to be determined. But I'm just talking as somebody who creates uh, things myself. Um, I looked at that and I said, that was like when Mike Milken created the junk bond market. Didn't right. exist. Didn't exist in 1982. And he sat around, he came up with the whole thing, and now everybody you know, in finance um, of a certain type you know, either invests in, in junk bonds or issues them if you're in the buyout business. And it was one man's right. genius. It's very much like Massa. Let me ask you this. What do you make of the reputation or image of the world of private equity. And I will tell you, because I remember it very well, and you do too, um, in 2007, and you make reference to it in the book, but only, only in a paragraph, um, there were a handful of things that happened. You went public. You had a 60, famous 60th birthday, um, which became a symbol of the times. Um, and there became what became known as the Blackstone tax never went into effect. I think you might have even blamed me at one point uh, for uh, promoting the tax. Um, you write, by the way, about the birthday, because I was looking for it, um, a little understated. You said, it was a great night despite unfavorable media coverage, which created some controversy around the event. <laughs> I, I stand by that. <laughs> But no, really, and especially today, I'm curious, because there is, of course, this big discussion in America about the idea of inequality and where we are, and sort of how you think the private equity industry fits into that. Well, there are about four or five questions buried in there. Um, I, I, I think the private equity industry has, has, has um, in, in effect, suffered from, from some of the practices in the 1980s when it was mostly a cost-cutting you know, kind of business. Uh, and, you know, s starting, you know, sort of 15, 20 years ago, that, that really changed. Because as prices go up, you can't make money by cutting prices. The only way you can make money uh, is, is by making the asset that you grow grow really fast. And the only way assets grow fast is you have to invest money in them. And if the objective, uh, is, is to grow faster because then your exit multiple is much higher than when you buy it and your earnings are much higher. Uh, th that's the way uh, that, that the business has to be done. What happens at that time uh, is simultaneously as you're growing, you're hiring more people. So it's a really positive sums game. Uh, and, and some people look at this and you know, realize that at some point, Sometimes you have to change what the company's doing. And, and you know, some people uh, you know, don't, don't remain em employed, but you hire other people to take those jobs. So there's some turnover maybe in a first year. But the objective 
is to build a much bigger, much better company. So, you know, our, our companies at Blackstone grow significantly faster than the S&P. And we end up earning around, um, after fees, um, you know, I'd roughly double uh, the S&P. Uh, and, and, you know, we've created uh, somewhere around 100,000 jobs in the last 12 years. And I, I look at this and say, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, and, you know, sometimes, you know, people will say, well, this company owned by the private equity industry went uh, broke. Well, you know, if you're in the retail business now, you, you don't have to be in the private equity business to go broke. You've got plenty of help, you know. Um, and, and if you're in the news, so somebody else will say, well, you know, there's a company owned by private equity in the newspaper business. You know something about this. And, you know, how many newspapers have done well over the last 15 years? And, and so they take one example. Meanwhile, you know, 40 newspapers go broke that have nothing to do with private equity. But it's convenient to, to point this out. Uh, going through the financial crisis, um, you know, private equity companies didn't go broke any more than unleveraged companies. A bit of a proof of concept, I would say. That was the global financial crisis, supposed to make a mess, and, and it didn't, which surprised people. And, and so I, I, I look at a lot of this and say, part of this is left over. Part of it is, you know, people don't understand exactly what we do, and we are obviously terrible marketeers explaining what we do. I, I had a very funny conversation years ago uh, with Mrs. Mer Mer Mrs. Merkel, who, who, who had just become head of uh, Germany. Uh, and, and, you know, there was some adverse publicity, and she asked to see me. So They I were went, calling you locusts at the time. Yes, they were calling us locusts. So, so I went to, to meet with Mrs. Merkel. It was a small meeting. Uh, you know, it was myself, and she had somebody with her who's now head of the Central Bank of, of Germany. And um, so, so she wanted to know about private equity. And uh, she said, um, uh, I don't even know if I should do this, but, but she said, I heard you are locust. <laughs> I'm with the Chancellor of Germany. I can't believe this, right? So, and so she's I, doing it with the fingers. Yeah. So, so, so I, said, I said, Mrs. Merkel, um, I am good locust. <laughs> So you want to know how this stuff works. So she said, she said, basically, tell me what you do. So I told her what uh, we do. And she said, that sounds very logical. She said, so if it is so good, why are not all companies private equity companies? Because she was a physicist, so she's very logical. And um, I said, well, some of them just don't fit if they need massive expenditures like mining companies. And, certain other things, but others of them would profit from doing that. She said, she said well, I, I didn't know anything about this, but now, now I understand. So, uh, you know, it's like being a prophet to people who don't want to listen. But, but it, this is actually a very good uh, uh, thing, and, and, you know, it involves uh, 11 million workers in the United States now. Uh, out of 151 million uh, people who have jobs. So it's not real big. Uh, in You're saying scale. for the private equity industry? Yes. Still. Yeah, it's not that, you know, it's not that big. Can, can we engage in a talk about, about carried interest? Because you know I have my views. If you would and, like to and you have yours. hold forth on this, Andrew. Well, I, I, just, I, just I always like listening to you. No, no, I, you don't have to listen to me. I would just say to you, and I just want to understand the argument, because I have, I've struggled, as you know, for, for more than a decade now to understand the argument, because I feel like that your tax structure on a personal basis is more incentivized than my tax structure. I happen to be a W-2 uh, employee in life. Uh, you may actually, I don't know if you're a W, you're part of a partnership, so I don't know how that's it, exactly structured, but the point is that, that, that your income to some degree is more advantaged, if you will, than mine, irrespective of our own investments, meaning I could, I could have investments in the stock market, you could have investments in, in the stock market, or you could have investments in your uh, things. I'm happy to, to capture the capital gains that way, um, but on the actual work product, this is one of the few industries where the work product counts in part as a capital gain. That would be my argument. What's yours? Well, I can never win an argument with Andrew. 
let's start from there. But this has only been going on for almost 100 years. Uh, Our know, debate, or? No. <laughs> as old as I am, I'm not that old, uh, and, and neither are you. The carried interest has been treated as a capital gain for, you know, since the 1930s. So, so th th this debate has, has, has become uh, politicized. It was always a uh, capital gain, and, and, and so, so it's a politicized thing now, uh, which, which you, you can always take uh, any side of that. So uh, I, I actually don't want to spend my evening of, of right. fighting a hopeless fight uh, with, with Andrew, but you, know, you, you, you should recognize that you know, um, uh, for any of us who, who work in uh, uh, New York City, who live in New York City, uh, with the kind of incomes uh, we have, carried interest, capital gains, ordinary income, your tax rates are somewhere between 45 and 50 percent. Uh, you know, this, this is like a lot. Uh, there, there's no avoidance, there's no sort of odd behavior that, you know, some people uh, have. We don't, you know, we have like, the income's the income and that's the range of what we pay. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot of money because we, we do well financially, but in terms of paying taxes, it's very substantial. Okay, that's a longer debate, and, and we're, we will continue to have it over the many years, but we're not going to do it right now. I do want to talk a, a bit about uh, philanthropy, and, and then I want to get to uh, where we are in the economy and, uh, and your relationship with Donald Trump and the Chinese at the same time. Um, but I want, to do, I want to do philanthropy first. Sure. You have managed to give away $100 million to start the Schwartzman's uh, Scholar Program, which is a road-like scholar program uh, for uh, US and Chinese students. Um, you've uh, d devoted $150 million to uh, Yale to create a culture and student life center there. $350 million recently to MIT for a new college of computing uh, related to AI. Um, and then a $188 million donation to Oxford University in the UK for humanitarian, uh, hum, hum, uh, uh, humanities, uh, it's a humanities hub is what it is. Plus, plus, plus um, New York Public Library. Plus the New York Public Library. For 100. And yeah. some... Thank you, Tony. So my question is, I assume you get asked, if not every hour, at least every day for money. How do you decide where to give, when to give? Um, what, what's the thought process in all of this? And what's your next big one? Yeah, that's, it is weird. People you know, come to see you, and they have all kinds of uh, projects if they can find their way in the door. Um, you know, usually, you know, you have like a gatekeeper or, the, you know, you ask to see something and people just don't, you know, pop in like it's an Avon lady, you know, just a, <laughs> can I have a hundred million dollars, please? You know, just it doesn't work like that. Uh, but, but, you know, um, everybody has things that interest them. Uh, sometimes you don't know exactly the form that'll take uh, unless somebody, uh, 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 puts a proposal or an idea uh, in front of you. And, you know, I, I, I care about certain uh, things like we all do. I care about too many things. Uh, you can't do them all at once. And, and I've learned what I like doing is creating new institutions. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I give a lot of money to existing institutions, but my, my really big uh, donations come to create something, whether it's Schwarzman Scholars in, 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 uh, at Chenhua University in uh, China to, to take students from around the world, including Chinese uh, mainland students, to, to basically try and uh, you know, teach them about China, teach the Chinese about what's going on around the world, to form a cadre of future leaders to try and protect the world. Uh, for the kinds of stuff that appears to be going on now. I mean, that's a pretty abstract concept, but when you experience the populism that we all had uh, after the financial crisis, it became pretty clear somebody was gonna go after, you know, sort of the prosperous foreigners which were viewed as China, and when they did that, you, you can end up with, uh, you know, sort of the rivalry and the potential uh, risks to the two societies, and you know, there's a professor who wrote a book, wrote a book on this after we made the decision, um, 
and, and studied you know, the, the, the 16 different times uh, it's, it's, it's in the last 500 years where, where a challenger country was challenging an incumbent world power. And in 12 of those 16 times, there were wars between the challenger and the incumbent. So I didn't know those statistics, but I could feel it. And I wanted to do something to get in the way of that. So, so we created a whole you know, built-in you know, college. And you know, we've got students, live students, professors. It's really amazing. It's extraordinary, the people that we've gotten. And now it's, it's sort of like the Rhodes and the Marshall. And you know, we accept you know, like 4%, and we get 97%. So each one of the things I've done addresses some interesting issue like AI and, and the need to, to basically protect society from, from the kind of just, just willy-nilly implementation of this powerful technology, which, which could end up not only doing some amazingly positive things, but, but can result in large-scale unemployment. Can I ask you about the Schwarzman Scholars? Because given the rift that has emerged between the United States and China, and given what the underlying effort that you are undertaken is, um, what do you tell President Trump? And what do you tell the Chinese right now? Well, I can't tell you what I'm telling everybody, because that's a secret. Um, but, but you know, in terms of the, the school was, you know, was, was endorsed by, by President Xi. It was his first act. Uh, in his so are you upset, term. though, about what's happening? Because I would say this isn't as much, I mean, there's the, the trade war is real, but it seems to me that there's something much larger going on here at play, yeah. which is to say the idea of us coming together, um, which I think was hopefully the prevailing wisdom, maybe even over only several years ago, is now going in the opposite direction and, and likely to do so for, for a much longer time. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I, I think there's no doubt that, um, you know, just to set context, um, China, um, in the last 40 years, has grown faster um, than any other country, I believe, in world history. Uh, it's, 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 it's an astonishing thing, that, uh, what's happened there. But they did it behind uh, tariff walls, uh, be, behind um, not, not traditionally open markets. Uh, they did it with certain types of uh, you know, uses of intellectual property and other types of things that, that we don't do uh, in, in the West and we don't do in developed countries. Part of what they're doing just follows the, the normal uh, uh, trend of uh, which, which the United States did in the 19th century. When we were little, we had big tariff barriers. People forget this. And then you get to be a grown up and then you drop that stuff away. And, and so because of the populism, uh, that, that's, that, and, and, and the terrible outcomes for the bottom 40 percent or so of people in the United States and other countries in the West, that those people are, have been, been really uh, put in a bad situation, uh, and they're angry, and their anger was going to go to China. So because after they exhaust targets uh, in, in, in their own country and nothing changes for them, then they get angry at a foreign person. And this is like a pattern that always happens with populism. And, and so this was coming at China. Uh, and you know, they didn't know it, and I told them. I said, it's not about who, who's in the White House. This is like a problem for our society. And we have to get balance back. And so you put this more on them to fix than on us to fix. Yeah, because in effect, they, they, they were, um, they, they, they had a different economic model. So, so you know, they, they would have to change to be more like a, a grown-up uh, country rather than a developing country. And, and so what, what's going on is as they figure out how much they want to change, how quickly they want to change, we on our side, of course, would like them to change, you know, absolutely quickly. Uh, on their side, imagine their politics. Um, you know, they, it's sort of like things are working out really great for us. Uh, why don't we just continue doing it? And 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 so that's where the tariffs came from. Uh, and and now we've got two countries that look like they're decoupling, which will end up 
damaging them long term, probably us long term, the emerging markets who won't sell as much to them, and Europe as well, which, which may well go into a recession because their interest rates are so low, I don't know how they stimulate themselves. And if they go into recession, it could look like Japan, uh, which went into a recession and basically stayed at no growth for a very long, 25 years. So, so, so this is a dangerous situation. And, and I, I think one of the reasons why you know, they've come back to the table uh, is, is that this is not in the short term, intermediate term, or long term interest of, of their country. It, it's, it's, I don't think it's in our interest as well, and it's not in the interest of the world. And so because of that, I, I think logic would suggest that, that they will uh, find a way uh, to do uh, steps uh, that, that, that will start. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, there's no miracle cure for this, because who would give up whatever you did that got you from no place to where you are just in, in one move that's never going to happen? But you know, we, we have to get used to changes happening over time. And we'll see if that happens in the short term or the intermediate term. But just letting this thing run, which is emotional reactions that people have. And also, each country has their own internal politics. Uh, and we, we think we know ours. But over there, they've got them too. So, so it's, it's dynamic. It's complicated. But, but ultimately, you know, really full decoupling, I think, is, is not uh, productive for the world. OK, I'm going to go rapid fire, because I want to get everybody involved in this in just a moment. Uh, you write this about uh, President Trump talking about emotional and, and uh, tweeting. Uh, but, but you write, uh, from the moment Donald Trump was elected, I had been getting calls from people who did not know what to make of him. When they, had, when they made that call, what did you tell them? I told him not to listen to these tweets. Told him not to listen to the tweets? No. Because? Because there's just so many, and they're it's just, it's, it, he'll, I, I said he'll. Do you ever say to him not I, to tweet? I, 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 I said he'll end up controlling your news cycles. And, and you, you know, and that's exactly what's happened. I, you know, I had the head of one of the major media uh, companies come and see me and say, what do I do? I said, don't cover it. Why not? I mean, don't you think it's our job to cover it? It feels like it would be that's, malpractice not to cover it. That, 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 that's what he said. And I said, so then you know, you're going to just be run around all the time. And you know, I, I, I don't think all these things are meant to be you know, sort of taken seriously. And you, you're just going to like go all over the place. And you know, so, so that's what you've that's what, you know, chosen to do. And, um, you know, but people don't have to listen to me. I mean, just. OK, different question. Uh, philanthropy. There is a debate in this country, by the way. And I applaud you. And, and I know a lot of people in this room applaud you for what you've done. But there's a debate in this country about what philanthropy has done for people who give. Maybe you, you will say this is the skeptical or cynical take. But there's a, there's a debate going on right now about naming rights, about whether people should have their names on things, whether there's greenwashing, that is, is, is the phrase. And obviously, in this sort of age of, uh, uh, of this uh, Jeffrey Epstein story, which has uh, dominated so many different news cycles, there's this conversation that, that, that charity um, may not be charity. What do you think of that? You know, it's interesting, because you know, I've, I've heard this. And uh, I, was, um, I was at uh, Oxford. Uh, and um, I didn't know that much about Oxford. And somebody was taking me around. And uh, you know, every college has got a name. And I, you know, I'd go by it. I think they have like 30 colleges or something. And I said, what, what's that one? Oh, that, that's the name of some business guy in the 1300s who gave that. And uh, really. And um, you, know, you, you, you go into another college, and they have a library. And they have these stained glass windows. And you know, they've got all these crests, uh, uh, coats of arms on there. I said, that's very clever. Coats of arms looks nice. They said, no, no, those are our donors. 
And if you, if you gave books to the library, you got your name up there, in effect. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and basically, almost all of Oxford, except for you know, whatever one of the archbishops gave, and, and Henry VIII uh, and Elizabeth I was, was given by people. And, and that's the way they constructed you know, what some people would rank, and certainly in the humanities, number one uh, university in the world. Uh, and you know, I, I talked to them about this. They say, problem? No problem. This is how you build you know, a university. Uh, and, and they have. And if you go to almost any you know, sort of um, university in the United States, I mean, the buildings are all named for people. The professors are named, the whole thing. So, so you know, if you go to hospitals, uh, you know, I was just in uh, New York Hospital for something. You know, it's the Greenberg Pavilion. It's a, every, everything. Ron Perlman's Heart Institute. This one's this. And you know, so, so you know, a lot of uh, what we've, what we take for granted, um, is you know, Mr. Frick's museum. Um, you know, it's 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 what the tradition has been in a non-government dominated. Right. Uh, uh, you know, type type of. Uh, okay, I got a, I got a harder one for you. You know the head of MIT. You just gave him three hundred fifty million dollars. Yes, I do. He's involved in this Epstein mess. Do you think he should keep his job? Yeah, I think I think what this is a complicated one. Anybody who gets near Jeffrey Epstein just gets set on fire. Um, you know, you don't even have to do anything with him. Uh, and um, so, so so that situation was was basically. Um, all uh, developed uh, with some donations that he gave after he um, uh, was out of jail, uh, you know, on a, a previous uh, administration. All, all of these anonymous things and so forth had nothing basically to do with the current president. Um, so, so um, you know, it's, you know, there's a few million dollars involved evidently and, um, you know, sort of the, from what I can figure out, the um, admissions people green-lighted taking the money, uh, you know, from, from one of the departments uh, and kept it anonymous so that Epstein wouldn't get uh, any credit, couldn't build on it. And, and that's erupted into, um, you know, sort of uh, today's scandal, today's Epstein scandal. So you'd say keep his job? I, I think, yeah, if he had been the person who green-lighted all of that, no. But he wasn't. He just okay. inherited this. Um, I think there's a, a, at least some reporting that, 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 that may debate some of that. But let me ask you a, a, a different, different question about the business roundtable. Yes. Um, Blackstone is part of the business roundtable. The business roundtable famously several weeks ago came out uh, with a statement about uh, the purpose of business. Um, and part of that new statement effectively suggested that uh, the role in the community uh, and the role in society and, and, and a number of other issues came uh, or was the responsibility of a company almost before it got to profits. Um, I should tell you that I think 180 out of 188 companies signed it. Um, you didn't sign it. I asked Stephen Mnuchin, our Treasury Secretary, last week whether if he was on the business roundtable, if he would sign it, and he said he would not. And so I want to know why you didn't. Well, the Wall Street Journal didn't think it should be signed. Um, and um, uh, Bloomberg didn't think it should be signed. And the Council of Institutional Investors, which is $4 trillion of money, uh, you know, didn't think it should be signed. So, so let's, let's go from signing as one issue to what they're talking about. That, you know, the, the idea that business should be concerned uh, about their employees, uh, about their customers, uh, about their suppliers, about their community, and, and, you know, sort of incidentally about profits, leave profits out for the moment, those four constituencies are very important. And I, I think that all of us, certainly uh, my firm, Blackstone, you know, has lots of programs that address uh, that, you know, and, in terms of communities, we've hired 75,000 veterans because Mrs. Obama asked us to do that. We're going to get to 100,000 uh, 
uh, veterans. We've got 200,000 students that we've you know, helped uh, uh, finance startups. Uh, every place we go, uh, we've got um, you know, sort of 80% of our, our employees spend uh, at least seven hours um, uh, 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 a year on paid and time off to work for charities. You know, we, uh, that's just in the community section. In every one of these, we have these very, very robust things. So it would now, be easy to sign it. Now, no, the, the, the issue is, you know, why are we in business? We're in business. I know why we're in business, because people give us money to manage, because they want us to, to earn a lot of money to give them back, or else they would give us nothing. So it's very clear to me why we're in business. And, and so uh, the way this statement was written, those five things are sort of equal. And uh, I have trouble managing when I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. So I know what I'm supposed to be doing, which is making good investments safely uh, and having a great contribution to these pension funds and regular people. Right. Now, should we do these other things? Sure. Do we do these other things? Sure. That's not the way the statement was written. It was written, basically, everything is equal. I don't think you can manage appropriately to do that. And, and so we didn't sign the thing. I, I don't look at that as a big deal, um, because we do everything anyhow. And, and so uh, the reason the BRT could do that is that the companies that belong there, which are, you know, I guess, about 200, roughly, of the biggest companies in the country, because everybody's already doing it. So, so that's not a big deal. So, so in, in a way, it's a confirmation uh, of what people were doing. Uh, our, our, our general counsel said, Steve, you can't put yourself in this conflict position where nobody knows what your priority is, because you can't have five priorities and trading them off. On the other hand, you can do all these things you know, in, in a sensible you know, ESG-oriented way. And we're proud of what we do. I, I don't like having this discussion. It's not as much fun to be the odd person out. But the fact that you, know, you have all these other people, from the Treasury Secretary down, saying that he wouldn't sign it, not because you don't believe in, in, in honoring and doing something important for all those constituencies. We're voted the best place to work in finance. How are our employees doing? Apparently OK, right? And, and so I, I look at this as a little bit of a red herring. OK. That's uh, we're going to open up for questions. Final question from me. And I know we're going to run out of time, but uh, this is my favorite sequence in the entire book. Um, this is about Christine, your now wife. Uh, this is the first date, folks. Uh, I thought our first date was great. She thought it was weird. Uh, she was expecting me to pick her up, but I was working late, and we were going to a party close to my office. So I sent a car over to get her instead. I jumped in the car and said, hi, I'm Steve. And then I proceeded to flip down the visor mirror and run an electric shaver over my face. Didn't make a good impression. I mean, I always, you know, um, you know, had the car. And when I got in the car, I was always rushing because we didn't have a big staff. And it was you know, like 1993. And the business was exploding with growth. I wasn't a great manager, so I'm working, you know, like some rat in a maze, uh, you know, looking for cheese. And, and so, you know, I, I just couldn't. If I wasn't working on something, <laughs> there there wasn't anybody else working on it. Uh, so, so you know, I just sent the car over to pick uh, my date up, and you know, and, and we I had like a thing with my driver where I got in the car, he'd give me the shaver, and you know, because I didn't look so good, and I wanted to clean up. I did. The fact that somebody was sitting there just didn't, <laughs> didn't, didn't compute. And I, I, I looked over. You know, I was like, you know, in the mirrors. And I looked to my right. And this person was just completely shocked. And then, and then I realized she should be. I mean, it was just, you know, like, there you go. And she's your wife. She's Thank my wife. you, Steve Schwartzman. <laughs> really appreciate it. Let's try to open it up and get a couple of questions. I have gone way over time, and I apologize to everybody here. We will literally try to do it uh, just a handful of questions. There are some mics here. And why don't we think, maybe try to do two on this side and 
Well, we only, let's see if we can do two or three on this side and try to sneak some in if we can. And if not, that's fine too. Just go. You have a question? You want to scream it out? Well, I can scream it out. Actually, they're going to probably want you to, to, to use the microphone. <laughs> This looks like a serious question. It is said that by 2050, more people will die from infectious disease due to antibiotic resistance, primarily because of the current factory farming and agricultural practices. And also, as we know, there's an alarming rise in nationalism and anti-Semitism in the world, especially with the Holocaust only a few years ago. Do you have any vision or any initiatives to both save the planet and create world peace? I'm, I'm sort of doing the best I can. Uh, but, but I've got my limits, uh, like, like we all do. Uh, the OSHA thing, what was that? I you know what, on that note, I think we could, uh, unless, sir, are you, you going up for a question too? Or are you taking off? It's okay. Um, I don't know about uh, the second question. He's got a question. Uh, two questions, if I can, sort of bookends on your career. Um, I wonder if you could talk about what your primary takeaway from your experience at Lehman was at the time, and then reflecting on what happened to the firm. Um, Great question. You know, how you think about it today, what, what lessons might be learned. The second thing, your gift, to, hugely generous gift to MIT and artificial intelligence, there are new technologies coming a mile a minute um, at the world, AI, robotics, additive manufacturing, big data, all of these things, which stand to increase productivity in the United States and elsewhere enormously, but also potentially have an impact on jobs. Um, and how do we train people so that the world, everybody benefits, and we don't have a greater disparity between wealth and the folks who get left behind? I have the first one. The, well, I, why don't we take this? You want to take the second second question? You want to take, do Lehman Brothers first? I take, the, well, the lessons of Lehman Brothers. My goodness. First, you should have good governance. We, we, we could have. You know, in my, my time, do you, just, do you want the 2008 version of Lehman or the 1984 version of Lehman or the 1993 version of Lehman that went busted all three times? Well, you you know, know. Or the 1973 version where it also went busted? Well, the 1970 to 72 version, which is when I was there. Okay. So, so, so basically, the firm was undercapitalized uh, and it had a trading operation, uh, which um, uh, basically was not appropriately controlled, uh, and, and uh, it, it ended up in uh, real financial difficulty, and it was uh, rescued. Um, the size of these institutions, um, I, I went to uh, a funeral for the, um, uh, I guess about three years ago, uh, for the, for the president of Morgan Stanley, and he became president in 1975, I think it was Parker Gilbert, and uh, in 1957. And Morgan Stanley had $7 million of equity capital. You can't make this stuff up. And I think Lehman in 1972 was maybe double. It's, it's incomprehensible how small these businesses were, and it was easy for them to get into trouble, particularly as, 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 as you know, Lehman migrated into trading, which was, was highly leveraged. And if you made a real mistake and you didn't have the right risk controls, you know, it was really put you in a, a terrible situation, which was rescued always by the same thing. Either somebody buys you or someone puts more capital in. So that was the first. The second question. This, What's Excuse me? AI. AI. Effects of oh. AI on productivity. A AI. And what's going to do to jobs? So AI is like really unbelievably, you know, sort of fascinating. This is going to change, well, this is going to touch everyone's life. You're not going to be able to 
get away from this technology. It'll do some amazing things like probably cost, uh, take the cost of drugs down, uh, you know, drug development in, in, in half. You, you'll, you'll have remarkable things in education where, where people can be educated by machines. I mean, there, there's one crazy thing that somebody was telling me about at MIT where, you know, like um, uh, yeah, kids um, from, from, you know, sort of lower income and middle income families can have pet dogs that are like machines. And the dogs can teach them all the time and the dogs will go with them everywhere. And, you know, it's like the dog will be your friend. Like for real, not like a dog dog. Like, you know, I've got three dogs. I mean, I love them. They jump up on me. I pet them. These are different. These are talking dogs. And, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll quiz you. They'll brief you. They'll teach you. Uh, and, you know, th th these are just little parlor tricks. But, but what, what, what's happening, I'll, give you, I'll just give you one idea. Uh, I, I had a guy come to see me about two months ago uh, from another country, and he said, he said, uh, uh, Mr. Schwarzman, I'd like to offer my services and uh, help reduce your costs uh, at your companies. And uh, we have about 200 companies that we own. So I said, well, what, what do you have in mind? He said, well, I think we can get rid of 40% of the people in your HR uh, and your accounting department. I said, how do you do that? He said, well, it's actually very easy. Uh, we just take a camera and we look at what everybody's uh, uh, working on their processes, and, and then you know we we stick a thing into the hard drive, and uh, then we know everything that they're doing, and then poof, you don't need forty percent of them. We can just do it, mm -hmm. and you'll save an enormous amount of money. And then we're getting going on different departments. And I, I listened to this. I said, "Well, how advanced is this technology?" He said, "This technology is primitive." It, it's there right now. I, you know, I could do this for you, you know, like next week. And you talk about an existential question. I said, where are you going to do this? He said, there are about 80 countries that would work well with this. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be one of the richest people in the world. And I'm sitting there going, OMG, what kind of challenge? is this to the society as we know it. Because we talk about creative destruction. This ain't creative. This is just destruction when you unemploy so many people so quickly and you do it globally. Uh, so so, so the, the, the reason I'm involved with AI is, one, to push things forward because they're fascinating good things. But the AI ethics component mm -hmm. uh, has to be developed internationally, and the technology needs to be controlled because you can't have some of these adverse uh, outcomes. Who's going to take care of all these people? What is the purpose of a human once all these machines start really getting their mojo, right? And, and, and so, you know, some of us, uh, and, and interestingly, the technologists who invented the internet. There are such people. The internet wasn't always there. It was just sort of like some thing in the ground that the Navy did or something. But you know, somebody invented how to take it from that. And I, I know a bunch of these people. Every one of them regret that they went forward with the internet. Because the dream, they thought it was cool. The dream of connecting the world is a great dream. It's happened. But they didn't foresee all of the destructive elements, the social media, the, the, the abridgment of free speech, all the things that are happening as, as a result of the internet. And they look at it and say, geez, I wish it hadn't happened. And they don't want it to happen again with the next technology, right? So, so this is a worthy pursuit to, to take the world and come up with standards and educate governments who really are just very far behind to come up with things to protect uh, society but have the benefits of what will be an extraordinary set of technologies. We're going to get the hook. So I'm going to try to make the question 30 seconds, and you're going to have 60 seconds to answer, and then we'll get that last question in, I promise. Okay. Wow. Thanks for the pressure. Sorry. <laughs> 
Um, I've been waiting all of my life to ask you this question. So I'm thinking about money and how money is compiled and then how the gatekeepers give it out. I read this book called Winners Take All. You all should read the book. Good book. And uh, it's a good book. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it exposes and talks about the notion of philanthropy and how is the money raised and then how it's like, so how did you get all of that money to then so-called so solve this problem? Not saying that you're guilty of that. But my question is, how can we have a more sustainable way in which money is accrued and so that we're not profiting and making money off of the destruction of our environment, the destruction of communities, so that maybe there's less philanthropy because the money is actually distributed in ways that are more equitable. And then, I mean, big question. And then the second one is the notion of woke washing, which I talk about a lot um, as a digital strategist. Uh, the notion that institutions and individuals act like they care about social justice issues when really they just put their money in causes just to say, hey, look, I funded this cause. Look, 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 I care, you know, but not necessarily actually caring. Like they'll fund the environment, but then we'll still have like Febreze in their bathroom, which destroys the environment. So how can institutions actually be more aligned with progressive change? You got a thought? Well, why don't you give me the first one? I had trouble hearing. The, fir the first question effectively uh, is, is really about this book, Winners Take All, which is this idea that Wealth in America has been concentrated in the hands of few, not many, and that effectively wouldn't it, be, I mean, the book effectively makes the argument that rather than leave it to philanthropists to figure out where they should be putting that money, that that money should have filtered itself into the government through taxes and other things, and that that would be a more democratic approach. And, and I, I would ask you, what do you think of that? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um on uh, both sides uh, in terms of allocation uh, of monies. The biggest issue for me uh, is, is that the education uh, that people get uh, in America now is, is not up to the task of helping people get the appropriate jobs. Uh, and we're, we're suffering, in a way, in, from from, from income inequality, yes, but it's really income insufficiency. We've always had income inequality. And, but, but what we've had historically is everybody's been able to have a good deal. You know? and, and that's not the case now. And a large part of it is, is because our, our primary and secondary education system, which used to be at the top of the world when I was young, apparently I'm no longer young, and now, and, now, and now we're down, I think well, I'm young, uh, but um, now we're about number 30 in the world. You, I'm a teacher as well, you, so I'm well aware. You cannot have a country that is not prepared to compete on a global scale. There is no reason for it, there is no excuse for it, and, it, and, and, and it's, it's, it's so horrible on people who are not prepared. Uh, it's, it's not a failure, per se, of the business community. If you don't get the raw material and, you know, of people who are educated. So I, I think there's a lot of things you can do uh, with that. Uh, the Catholic schools in New York do an amazing job. Uh, they've got 90% uh, of their kids who are minorities, 70% at the poverty line or below. They graduate. 98% uh, of their kids and 96% uh, uh, go to college. This is such a different outcome with the same students that I, I am really optimistic. I also think that, um, that teachers should, should be the only group of people in society who do not pay tax. Oh, yes. and, and, and the reason is, is, is that they are underpaid. Yes, uh, yeah. And if we want to educate our, our children, uh, we, we have to put the best troops in the field. And right now, there's so many alternative things that they can do that you may not have the absolute best people that you did when I was educated in the 1950s and 60s. So if you gave them that special status, one, it's helpful for them financially, but at least as important, it marks them out as special people in our society with a special role.
Thank you for that. I know there's a second part to the question. We're going to run out of time. So I'm just going to get to that last question that you have right there. And I apologize. And, and, then, we're, and then we're going to unfortunately have to, uh, I know they're going to this, rip us off the stage. This, this is last dance. Last dance. Thank you. This was great. I have two quick last dance questions. The first is you mentioned how important it was to really understand people's problems. And then when you presented solutions, they would be open to hearing them. At this stage of your career, you certainly have the reputation and credibility that people like Trump and China will listen with open arms. As you were running through the ranks, though, and battling the duality of insecurity and self-confidence, how did you navigate the political Political nuance of having these ideas, but want, wanting people to actually listen to them rather than having a perception that you are omniscient and why should they listen to you as a young man in the industry? It's a great final question. Yeah. We're going to leave that as the final question. I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I think um, people respond uh, to somebody um, who's you know, who's, who's, who's pretty sincere, um, you know, in, in terms of addressing, uh, you know, things. Uh, and if, 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 you, if you basically make it clear that there's nothing in it for you, uh, it's, it's really just trying to help a, a situation, and, and you're snappy about it. No, nobody wants to wander around as, as, as you present grand visions. You, you gotta be sort of an effective salesperson and say, you know, I understand you're worrying about X or Y or Z. There are four things that you can do in this situation. As soon as you go into action steps, you don't have to describe problems for people who already know they have them. All they want to know is what are the solutions. So if you put four things out and two of them are really good, you, you got like a friend for like a long time because they've been working to try and get that situation resolved and they haven't done it. So anything that you can do, and you do it quickly and, and without emotion, and you know, just sort of lay it out, th th then they'll listen and you can help everybody. All I can say is you were really great sports to be here tonight. It was please, really nice. Please Thank join you. me in thanking Stephen Schwartzman. The book is called What It Takes. Thank you, Steve. You were a sport. <laughs>